Hi there, I'm Rebecca and a really warm welcome back to my channel, Pumpkin Becky. It's kind of drizzling here, but there's an awful lot of jobs to do in the garden today, so rain cannot stop play. I'm not going to do too much talking, you're just going to follow me around doing a variety of things in the garden. Let's get started. job I want to tackle is the hay baskets here. I planted them up maybe about a month ago using some of the alisum that I grew from seed and it's been really pretty but for some reason it had one flush of flowers, I cut it back and it hasn't really bounced back. So I'm going to pull these out and I am going to replace them with some alisum that I bought yesterday at the garden centre. These hay baskets have turned into a really interesting mixture of plants this year. I've got my busy Lizzie, and I've got my, mm, can't remember, lamb's ears? I never remember its proper name, it's probably a Senecio. Uh I've got a Heuchera, I've got some Calibrocha, and I have got Osteospermum, this is meant to be one called Happy Gaia but it has turned out to be a spider variety and I did report that to Van Muen along with my tomato debacles and they have refunded me so fair enough and I've also got this lovely white scabious I do not remember planting white scabious I love them they're adding so much height to, <laughs> to these baskets and they're so unusual you wouldn't think to to find them in a basket like this um, yeah <laughs> absolutely smashing and the bees are loving them really loving them it's a good opportunity to actually come around and take off any dead or dying leaves when I planted them I put a slow release fertiliser in and I have also been using a tomato feed every couple of weeks just to sort of keep it moving along. Here I've got a pack of alisum, this is snow crystal. I'm just going to pop these in. They probably won't trail like the other one did but hey, it's going to be that mixture of texture again. I've been watering these baskets really well, but it's remarkably dry in here. And I'm just adding back some multi-purpose compost, peat-free, just to bring the soil level back up. And then I'll repeat that with the other basket. I really like the look of these coir basket liners, but unfortunately so do my local nesting birds, and they pull chunks of it out every spring. something a little bit strange with this year's hanging basket in the front garden. Uh, this, this vine thing, is Thumbergia, which is a type of black-eyed Susan. And normally they're yellow with a black centre, but this year I've seen tons of different colours and I actually fell in love with this sort of almost like a Victorian 
crushed velvet pink colour. Can crushed velvet be a colour? I don't know. But that's what it reminds me of. And oh, petals are like velvet. They're so soft. I thought I would be able to use it as a spiller. And the other things I've got in here like the Nemesia and there should also be well there were some fuchsias in here goodness knows where that's gone they should all have been the thriller part of the hanging basket it became clear very quickly that that wasn't going to be the case and that the Thumbergia wanted to climb so what I did was I dropped the height of the hanging basket from the hook down lower so that I could use the hanging device as the climbing pole for the Thumbergia. And it is starting to cover. What I do need to do is take this Alison out as I did with the other baskets, but I'm going to replace it with something slightly different. You might be able to hear Katie barking, she can hear me out the front here. Sorry. I can also come back and pinch out some of the very long straggly bits of Nemesia and they will absolutely bounce back. Within a couple of weeks they will be thicker, fuller. As with any plant you're rejuvenating, it may look a little distraught to start with, but it will come good. Um, I must admit, however, that shortly after planting this, I dropped my basket and it's completely dented in the bottom. So, uh, yeah, I might have to treat myself to a new one next year. <laughs> I'm going to replace the Alison with these Marguerite. They should have been $3.99 a pot, but I got them for the princely sum of a pound. So I bought seven of them because... cool! So I'm just going to go through deadhead, take off any dead leaves, And they'll just be gap filling and the white flower will help to lift the arrangement because it is very very green at the moment. I'm going to remove a little bit of the compost from the root balls because what I took out didn't have that much on it so this is going to take up more space in the basket. I'm not careful, too much space in the basket. I don't want to take off too much root, but just enough to reduce the root ball a, a bit. Compost level has sunk a little since I planted it, so that's useful. Already that looks a lot better. The Allison was really struggling. This area is actually underneath my porch canopy. So it gets no watering at all. It gets plenty of sun, no water. So yeah, things really do have to be tough as old boots to be here. The next situation to address is this hydrangea it has chlorosis. There are several reasons why a plant can get like this. Normally it is to do with um, inefficiency in transporting nutrients from the soil up into the leaf mass. 
If you've seen any of my gardening videos before, you will know that we garden on a subsoil, which is clay, chalk and flint. And it's pretty nasty. And in this particular area, the topsoil is very shallow. I've been able to build it up more further along the garden, especially where it was dug up by the builders as they were working. But this area stayed relatively untouched, mostly because of the preservation order on the trees. We weren't allowed to disturb the roots at all. So there's probably a hard pan under here of clay. I've got a feeling there's also some old footpath left behind from the previous property. They had poured concrete footpaths everywhere. So we've got a bit of a problem here. One option is to move this plant altogether. Another is to try and amend the soil in a way that will support it and help it grow better. It's trying to flower. Bless it. it <laughs> it's doing its best. It's putting on new growth. They're just it's this chlorosis that is the problem and I'll show you a close-up of the leaf. This is a leaf suffering from the classic symptoms of chlorosis. You can see that there are dark green areas around the veins but all the rest of the leaf is this pale yellowy lime green colour, not even lime green, it's not that bright. Let's compare that to a more healthy leaf from a different plant. You can really see the difference. It should be dark and glossy like this one, not pale and pathetic like this one. I mean, it's big, but it should be that colour. I've been trying to help the situation by using this feed from miracle Grow, which is for azaleas, rhododendrons and camellias, which are all acid soil loving plants. It's a liquid. You can either apply it as a foliar feed or apply it to the soil surface. I've kind of been doing both. But it hasn't really helped and I think actually the problem is much deeper than that and it is the soil that is the real problem. The only way to deal with that is to add more organic matter, which I have been doing. I've been adding lots of my peat free multi-purpose compost that I have bought from a company called Earth Cycle um, and I'm also going to try applying some sulphate of iron which is a slightly more robust way of releasing the iron it takes longer it's, it is a more long term solution but hopefully a combination of this and the application of more compost will help. You could weigh it, but the box says that a handful is around 35 grams. The last job I want to do with you today is check on the status of the pumpkins and squashes. We're probably about two months off harvesting them and we really need to get in there, do a little bit of maintenance on the vines so that we make sure the plants aren't pushing lots of energy into fruit that won't ripen in time. Sometimes it can feel a bit like just throwing food away. <laughs> But actually you will get bigger, better, more able to store produce in the long run. So it is worthwhile doing. The vines of the squash plants are going fairly crazy. So it will do us lots of good to actually have a look at these because I know I've got empty squares 
in the square foot bed but I am darned if I know where they are <laughs> so this work really really has two important benefits first off let's have a little look at this cracker it's well worth me popping this up onto the wall edging so that it keeps the fruit away from any soil borne pests let's follow that vine along the bed it's this one which is this one haha mm -hmm. <laughs> right this is coming from Crown Prince and this is the Crown Prince plant that is going absolutely bonkers at the other side round by the chickens which we will have a look at. That means that this plant has got about, let me have a look, uh, it's got, it has a vine here, one, two, three, four, five, six, six vines come through, that's too many. So this fairly weak vine that I have coming off to the back, I'm actually going to cut off close to the base and remove it. There's no point in having too many vines, the plant, plant cannot support that much because this vine has a viable fruit on it. I'm going to leave that in place. We have this vine, which has yet to set any fruit. I'm just going to remove that. It's absolutely worth removing any rotting vegetation because that just encourages slugs and snails. Remove them completely from the bed. This vine is coming off the same plant, and that is my monster vine, which last time I showed you had got itself up to here, and now it goes right the way along and is now touching the chickens, and in fact. He's clinging on to the chicken run. <laughs> this vine is doing beautifully. That is an absolutely clonking squash coming along here. I would like to tidy up along here and just... We've got some vines trying to come along off the side. Those are all just removing energy from that main stem. So that's going to increase airflow around the plant, it's going to stop energy being diverted to the other vines and help the plant concentrate on producing and ripening those fruit. Look at that. Isn't that fantastic? The main stem also has a vine coming off to the side here, which again hasn't set any fruit yet. I'm going to cut that off as well. I have two yellow courgettes here which are yet to fruit. Then in the back that's red kiri and that is starting to set some fruit here. Next to the yellow courgettes this ooh, great long vine stretching off into the distance it's coming from oh oh no you're not wait for it this is sweet dumplings which was one of the ones that went in a bit later this vine is actually coming from the plant behind, which is... Of course 
course it is. Crown Prince. <laughs> I've just uh, hoofed that out of the way because it's going to give me a little bit of better access across here. I have courgette zucchini here that is actually starting to push a fruit finally so that's lovely. I'm going to take this yellowy leaf off. It doesn't need it. This plant here which is also throwing off some nice long vines is Autumn Crown. So that's looking like a very nice happy plant. So while I was in the square foot beds I quickly picked a couple of beetroot, very nice looking. I harvested a lovely handful of carrots from my Haxnix planters and I dashed over to the hawthorn tree and took a very small elephant garlic from the clump under there. I think we're going to have those for our tea. Right, it is really raining now. I can't stay out here any longer. That's it for this week's video. Thank you so much for watching. Please remember to rate, share and subscribe to me here on YouTube. And until next time, bye.